Okay, first of all, fellows, the yellow is mine. Here, uh, if you drink from mine, you get leprosy. So, uh, this this belongs to me. Uh, last summer, a pastor approached me, and he said, "Would I consider talking about a series on um, prophecy?" And I was happy to do that. And so, I have been spending quite a bit of time praying and studying, and. Um, <clears throat> How would I? How should I approach this? And so I'm going to approach it. Um, kind of starting up here, working uh, down various types of material. First of all, I'm going to start with the idea that I'm approaching it as a Christian. Now you might wonder why that is important, but when you stop and think, if you, especially if you go on the internet, uh, there are all kinds of atheists and agnostics and disbelievers and so forth who are quite to tell you that, um, you know, we're, we're the whole idea. And then you have the cult and uh, all of their, th their thoughts and beliefs on prophecy. And then you have, of course, uh, various uh, denominations and what they would think. So I'm going to start with the idea that as a Christian, I'm approaching this from of point of view, I'm approaching it from a um, favorable point of view, not an antagonistic point of view. Now remember, as we think about Christian, we're talking about a relationship, a relationship between ourselves and the Lord. And that relationship, of course, is key. That relationship does not depend on uh, the nations, does not depend on um, various other things. It depends on what we have done with the Lord himself. Okay, am I on now? Hello, am I there? Okay. Um, I could hear myself cutting in and out. So thank you for that. So as a Christian, we realize that that, that is a very broad spectrum. Uh, you know, there are Baptists who are Christians, there are Baptists who are not. There are Methodists who are Christians, there are Methodists who are not. There are Catholics who are Christians, there are Catholics who are not. It doesn't matter the denomination. What it matters is, what is your relationship with Jesus Christ? That's where Christian comes in. All right, given that, I am also a biblicist. Now, what is a biblicist? And we're gonna use terms, and when Daniel comes back, he'll be passing out uh, a flyer here that kind of gives you an outline of some of these things. A biblicist, we used to call them fundamentalists, okay? Uh, I am a fundamentalist, but unfortunately, the Muslim extremists and so forth have co-opted the term. And so when now, if you say you're a fundamentalist, oh, you're one of them, uh, you know, you believe in killing people and all that, that is not where we're at. We're at opposite ends of the scale. And so a lot of us has now decided to call ourselves biblicists. Now, biblicists would be those who hold the, the, the in, uh, central concepts of the Christian faith. Uh, we would believe in the virgin birth. We would believe in the deity of Christ. We would believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ, the inspiration of the scriptures, uh, salvation by grace through faith. Those are what you might call the core belief systems of a biblicist or a fundamentalist. And there are more. I'm just giving you some examples here. All right. Not all Christians hold to all of those things. Some Christians are Christians and they're, they're you know, saved at a very young age and then um, maybe they were in the bus ministry and, and then their parents moved and they've moved and they've never been in a good church since. They have no idea. Or maybe they're backslidden and they choose not to believe. That doesn't change the fact that they're a Christian because that is a personal relationship and God doesn't change his mind, okay? When you become a Christian, you're a Christian, period. The rest of your life, until you die. But some of these other things can change. 
So Biblicist is uh, one of those things that we consider very important, and, and, and that's where we're going to approach the whole idea of prophecy from, and you will see that some of those things really, really make a difference. Thirdly, I'm a Baptist. So I've started out way up here at Christian, which is, encompasses a huge amount. Then I've come down to Biblicist. Now I'm talking about narrowing in on scripture and, and you might say theology that's more conservative. Now I'm saying I'm a Baptist. Now, what's, when we think of Baptist, of course, often we think of baptism by immersion. That's one of the things that Baptists are known for. It's one of the things that they've died for, in fact, and been persecuted for, baptism by immersion. But we find that that is very important. Separation of church and state would be another thing that, that Baptists would hold as very, very, very critical. Um, I also feel that we are the closest to the scriptures. If I thought there was another group of people that was closer to what the scriptures said, that's what I would be. But I don't know of any other group that holds to the beliefs as the Baptists do that would, that's closer to scripture than we are. Now, before you think I'm just um, toting my own, you know, my own thing here, let me give you a couple of th quotes from other people that are not Baptist. This first one is from a fellow by the name of Dermot. He, he is a, a church historian of the Dutch Reformed Church, okay? Now this is what he says, quote, the Baptists may be considered as the early Christian community that has stood since the days of the apostles and as a Christian society has preserved pure the doctrine of the gospel through all ages. Talking about the Baptists. Another one, this is by Redpath. He's one of the world's best historians. He's a Methodist, okay? I should not readily admit that there was a Baptist church as far back as AD 100. Although without doubt, there were Baptist churches then, as all Christians were then Baptists. Now this is a Methodist saying, this is not me saying this, this is a Methodist saying now. I'll give you one more. This is from uh, Mosheim. He's a Lutheran. Before the rise of Luther and Calvin, there lay se secreted in almost all the countries of Europe persons who adhere tenaciously to the principles of the modern Dutch Baptists. The origin of Baptists is lost in the remote depths of antiquity. The first century was a history of the Baptist. So there are many others who also understand that we go back a long ways in terms of how we stand in terms of our belief system. I would also say here that I am approaching this from the view of a dispensationalist. Now we're down to Baptist now, okay, a dispensationalist. Now what is a dispensationalist? I'm using some big terms some of you are familiar with, some of you are not. A dispensation, it's a system or a, a belief system, a way of interpreting scripture. Dispensationalism is a method of interpreting history that divides God's work and purposes toward mankind into different periods of times. And there are seven of them, and I think they're listed on your, on your chart there. Innocence, conscience, civil government, promise, law, grace, and kingdom. And what we're saying is that God approaches, approached man differently during these various um, time frames. For example, innocence. This would have been Adam and Eve before sin. God personally visited with them. He doesn't do that now, does he? He personally talked with them. He doesn't do that now. We're in a different dispensation. And so God approaches uh, humans, humankind, differently during the different dispensations. Now, the opposite of dispensationalism is covenant theology. And this is a system, a systematic set of doctrine for interpreting scripture. It favors a literal interpre interpretation of the Bible, as we do, with some portions, such as Revelation, as allegorical or symbolic. They do not believe in the millennium, or most of them at least, the millennium, the rapture, or the tribulation. Now, if you're going to interpret prophetically what's happening in scripture, and you don't believe in the millennium, you don't believe in the rapture, you're going to have a completely different perspective on what's going on. Even more importantly, 
they view the church and Israel as one. Israel is the church in the Old Testament, and Israel and the church are one in the New Testament. And this is coming out. Now, one of the reasons this becomes important is because a lot of the people that you might be listening to on Christian radio hold this view. And if you don't know what they're holding, you may be led down the wrong way because you're, you're not paying attention and you're not going to catch some of the things that they say. And I hope as we go along here that I'll start pointing out, if you listen to so-and-so, you watch so-and-so on TV, you read such a magazine, be aware, this is where they're coming from. We had a young man here several years ago that came in, uh, stayed for several months, and he was ready to uh, debate pastor and persuade him on this whole issue, okay? Um, it can be very, very deceptive and disruptive. Now, I am skipping around here in terms of what's on your sheet. And I am going to go, because that clock is my enemy, I am going to go and use an example. And we're going to come back to these things as we have time either today or next week. So we're not going to lose them. We will indeed come back to them. But I want to talk about Tyre, T-Y-R-E. Now, if you go on the internet, <laughs> and you type in T-Y-R-E, you're going to get all sorts of tires. Car tires, uh, truck tires, all kinds of tires. And I looked at I said, what, didn't I type that in right? And then I realized, in England, a tire that we put on the car is T-Y-R-E. So if you ever go and check it out, you might check, you know, tire the ancient city or something like that, so you're not inundated with tires. Okay, now, given that, first here of Tyre in the Bible, back with David and Solomon, King Hiram of Tyre. He supplied them with uh, cedars for, the, for David's house, for Solomon's house, and for the temple, and also workmen. They were very, they were very skilled workmen. They um, went ahead and supplied them. Next time, well, at least one of the next times is in 1 Kings. King Ahab had a wife, Jezebel. She was a Zidonian, which is part of, of that whole area right there, Tyre and Sidon and so forth. Wicked, wicked woman brought in uh, the Baal worship into, into Israel. Problems for many, many years thereafter. But that's a second. Another time we have um, Nehemiah building the, 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 the walls of Jerusalem. And uh, he had built the walls, he got the, the, the uh, gates up, and he looks out, and here are the men of Tyre uh, bringing all their wares, their fish, whatever they brought, to the gates on the Sabbath. So he put his men out there, they shut the gates on the Sabbath, they still kept coming, they just camped outside the gates, and finally Nehemiah says, listen, if you come back, I'm going to lay hands on you, the words, I'm going to lay... So apparently they thought he was serious. They didn't bother coming back. And then we find again in the New Testament in Mark, Jesus goes to Tyre and Sidon, that area. And that's the Syrophoenician woman. You remember the one that, that was concerned about her daughter who was in, uh, had, a, had a demon in her and how the Lord healed the Syrophoenician uh, daughter. We also find it in Acts chapter 21. Paul, the end of his third journey, he comes back toward Jerusalem. He stops at Tyre. That's where he lands, in Tyre. And he goes ahead and spends, finds Christians there, spends a few days with them, moves on. Tyre itself was an amazing, amazing place. They were known for glassmaking. They were learned, known for purple dye. Those are murex, M-U-R-E-X shell. And it would take thousands and thousands of these shells to make one ounce of dye. And that's why in the ancient times, if you wore purple, you were nobility uh, of some sort because no one else could afford it. It was so expensive. And these were the folks that had uh, controlled that. They were also a prominent maritime, a preeminent, actually, maritime nation. They, they had their ships all over the Mediterranean. They traded regularly with England. They felt that well, all the way around Africa, and there's a, some evidence that they actually came to the Americas. Okay, this is before 
Christ. I mean, this way back. They were a, a tremendously prosperous and aggressive trading nation. If you go to Ezra, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 27, and we're not going to go there, but sometimes just go there, and it lists 35 areas, cities, nations, and regions that the Phoenicians traded in, and it tells you what they traded. They went to Israel, and they traded them with wheat, and so on and so forth. They went to Egypt, and they did such and such. They were 30, uh, 35 of them, just an amazing, amazing group of people had a powerful navy and army. In fact, at one, I read one thing where it said they had to have 50,000 rowers. And in fact, they needed so many. I always thought that rowers in those situations were, were uh, slaves. But they actually had to hire them. Didn't have enough, so they actually had to go out and hire them. You know, you, your kid goes to school. What are you, what's your dad? Well, my dad's a, uh, a policeman. Well, my dad's a soldier. Well, my dad, he's a rower on General So-and-So's ship. Third row up, six run back, wave at him every time he rows by. You know, I mean, they had to, they had to uh, actually hire people. Okay, having said all that, I'm going to step back for a minute, and we're going to go to Jerusalem. All right, and you'll see why here in a minute. Second Kings 24 and 25, we won't go there because I just want to cover this. We will get to Scripture here in a minute. King Jehoiakim is the king. Nebuchadnezzar comes in and uh, takes control, and, and, and the king submits to him for three years, then he rebels. Nebuchadnezzar has to come back, take over, and he puts King Jehoiachin, the 18-year-old son of Jehoiakim, in um, command. So he's now the king kind of serving under Nebuchadnezzar. He does that for eight years, and he rebels. And, you know, Egypt is going to take care of us, so on and so forth. It doesn't happen. The Nebuchadnezzar comes back, retakes Jerusalem. At this point, takes all of the Jewish, uh, the temple treasures, which are going to play a role later on, to uh, Babylon. And he sets up King Zedekiah, who is a 21-year-old uncle of the former king. He serves 11 years. Nine years in, he rebels. Nebuchadnezzar comes back again. 18-month siege. Zedekiah flees out the back door, so to speak. They catch him before he gets to Jericho. And the last thing he sees before they put his eyes out is them killing his sons. So it's quite a way to remember the last thing you see. Well, Nebuchadnezzar Enough is enough. I've been here three times. I am tired of all this. He burns every house within the city. He tears down the walls. Remember Nehemiah? So built we the wall. That's, this is why, because Nebuchadnezzar is sick and tired of these people. I'm taking them out of the way. I am destroying them. I'm taking everybody with me. And he does that. Let's go back to Tyre, because here, Tyre makes a dreadful mistake. They laughed. They rejoiced. Yay! Jerusalem's gone. Now, that's very important for them because Jerusalem controlled a lot of the trade coming in from the hinterland, so to speak. So they had a very lucrative trade coming in from the caravans and so forth. And now with Jerusalem out of the way, Tyre gets it. Turn with me to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 26. And it came to pass, we'll go 1 through 14. It came to pass in the 11th year, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, so it's talking to Ezekiel, and he says, Son of man, because that Tyre hath said against Jerusalem, aha, Okay, that's, that, that's Hebrew for laugh, okay? But, uh, all right, so here we go. He says, Alha, she is broken, that was the gates of the people. She is turned unto me. Uh, sh I shall be replenished. Now she is laid waste. So Tyre is very happy that, they, that Jerusalem has been laid waste. Ezekiel 26, pick, 
verse 3. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyre, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as a, as a sea causeth his waves to come up. They shall destroy the, the walls of Tyre, break down her towers. I will can't also scrape her dust from her, make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord, and it shall become a spoil in the nations. And her daughters, now the word daughters there is, the idea is the, the surrounding towns, okay, villages and towns which would be unwalled, okay, uh, which are in the field shall be slain of the, by the sword, and they shall know that I am the Lord. For thus saith the Lord God, verse 7, Behold, I will bring upon Tyre Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north, with horses and chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. And he shall slay the, with the sword thy daughter in the field, and he shall make a fort against thee, and cast up a mount against thee, and lift up the, the buckler, which is a shield against thee. He shall set engines of war against thee, battering rams, and with his axes he shall break down the towers. And it goes on and says, and then uh, verse 11, with the horns, horse, hoofs of the horses shall he tread down all thy streets. He shall slay thy people by the sword, and thy strong garrison shall go down to the ground. And they shall make a spoil of the riches of thy riches and make a prey of thy merchandise. And they shall break down the walls, destroy the pleasant houses. They shall lay the stones and the timber and the dust in the midst of the water. Okay. Verse 14, I will make thee like the top of a rock. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be built no more. For I, the Lord, have spoken it, saith the Lord God. So God, when... when God loves Israel. God chose Israel. God chose Jerusalem. That was his choice. He made it. And we need to be careful. Anybody needs to be careful when you start making fun of or rejoicing over something that happens to God's chosen people. Doesn't mean we have to always agree with them, but, but you need to be careful. Okay? So, what happens? Two years later, guess who sits in front of the walls of Tyre? Nebuchadnezzar. Now, he's just taken Jerusalem beforehand, 18 months, so now he sits in front of Tyre, and he's going to take Tyre. Thirteen years later, he takes Tyre. Now, think about this. Thirteen years, he sits outside that city. He's got to have a full army outside that city. You know, you've got to feed them. You've got to pay them. You've got to have all those siege engines. You've got to have all that stuff to, to push the rock up toward the, so they can get up over the walls. You've got oh, 13 years he did it. But hey, this is one of the wealthiest cities in the world, right? He's going to make all the money back. It's hard on the treasury right now, but hang on, folks. We're going to make it back. He finally takes the city. Bummer of all bummers. It's all gone. Because while he's working on taking that city, the people of Tyre have moved the city a half mile out in the ocean on an island. And all that wealth that he thought he was going to get to pay himself back from all of this expense he's had is gone. Well, it's very interesting what happens because, you see, because he had done the work that God had asked him to do, and we'll see that in a minute. God says, I'm going to pay you anyway. Go to Ezekiel chapter 29, just a couple of verses over, chapters over. Verses 18 to 20. Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald and every shoulder was peeled, yet had he no wages nor, nor his army. For Tyre, for the service that he served against it. God's speaking here. I've done the uh, Nebuchadnezzar, a wicked, uh, arrogant, sinful king, was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. Sometimes as Christians, we think, you know, oh, if I'm not going to do this, nobody can. God can use whoever he chooses. And sometimes he uses people and things and events that would probably really surprise us if we really understood what was happening. But here he says, for the service uh, that he, uh, 
uh, he had no wages nor his army of Tyre for the service that he has served against it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall take her multitude and take her spoil and take her prey, and it shall be for the wages for his army. That's God speaking. I, I'm going to take care of Nebuchadnezzar. He did what I told him to do. Even though he was a pagan king, he did what God wanted to do. God took care of him even in a situation like that. You get Egypt. Okay, so Tyre is now down, right? But it's a mess. Nebuchadnezzar didn't clean up the mess. He just left it. And if you're looking at scripture, it says right there that it's going to be bald like the top of a, like a flat, nothing there. Well, there's a whole bunch there. So what happened? Did God not, you know, did he make a mistake? What's going on here? Well, if you go back through and you look at back in chapter 26, starting say verse 8, it talks about he, okay? He shall slay with a sword. He shall make a fort. Uh, he shall set engines up. Uh, his horses. Uh, he shall enter the gates. Uh, he shall tread down the streets. He shall slay the people. And you come to verse 9, and they. Now, wait a minute. We've been talking about he, 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 he. Who's they? Fast forward 250 years to a 21 or 22 year old brass military genius called Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, his father was assassinated when he was 20. He takes over the kingdom of Macedonia, which is north of Greece, what is now Greece, takes over Greece, comes across the Hellespont, which is the, the land or the river between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, crosses that and he uh, takes on the, the, the king um, and, and actually, um, I'm trying to think of the king's name, uh, Darius, or Darius, I'm sorry, king of Persia at Isis in 333 BC and absolutely outnumbered three to one, he still destroys him. Darius flees, Alexander now controls. But Alexander realizes that before he can get, go down to Babylon and Nineveh and so on and so forth, he's got to worry about the backside here. He's got this powerful, powerful Phoenician army out there that he just can't ignore. So he comes back to the Mediterranean, the eastern side of the Mediterranean, and he works his way down what is now Lebanon into eventually um, Israel. And as he comes down, he, 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 the, the cities along the way either capitulate immediately and just surrender, or they put up a short battle and they're done and they're done. And he gets down, he takes Sidon, and Sidon just gives up, and he gets to Tyre. So as he approaches Tyre, the Tyrenians send him a golden offering, you know, welcome to the club, glad you're here, congratulations, etc., etc. He gets down further, and he's across from Tyre. It's a half mile out. And he says, hey, you know, I'd really like to worship your temple. Well, the Tyrians say, well, yeah, we got a better idea. You know, you know, the remains over there, well, there's a temple in the remains of old Tyre. Why don't you go over, help yourself, spend all the time you want, enjoy. There's a temple, help. Alexander says, no, 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 no. I want to worship in your temple. Well, the Tyrians are not stupid. They're thinking he's not coming alone. He's going to have his assistants and his associates and the generals and their helpers. And, you know, you know, you come to worship and you stay to, you stay, okay? And they say, well, no thanks. That's okay. We won't. So Alexander is now sitting half mile across here, and he says, I'll send an emissary. See if they can get them to, you know, just, just give up and no war and all that. Sends his emissary. Tyrenians take him. And they say, well, Alex, Alexander, since you don't understand here, and they kill the emissaries and drop them over the wall in front of Alexander. Alexander is absolutely furious. So he says, I'm going to take that. Now, he doesn't have much of a navy. So he says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to build a road out there. 
And he starts, well, you need material for a road, right? Now, where do you think I might find material for a road? And by the way, this road is 200 feet wide. Okay? Well, just look at all these ruins. And it's interesting, if you look at the scripture, in verse... Um, Let me see what, okay, verse 12. And they shall lay the stones and the timbers and the dust in the midst of the water. That word lay is actually the idea of planting. Now, as he, Alexander looked at, 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 at the water and stuff, there is kind of a, um, um, an area that's, that's higher in the ocean going across. And it's got a lot of mud and sand and so forth. And it's only, only about 18 feet deep. And so what Alexander did was he took the timbers and planted them in the dirt and the soil and the mud to keep in all of the stone and dirt and rock, whatever else he had that he was filling in with. God used the right term for what he knew Alexander was going to do when the time came. So he plants and he moves out there. He's got these two huge um, catapults. And he's, he's, he, eventually he gets out there and he takes the city and he kills uh, 8,000 or so in the, in the process of getting in. He crucifies 2,000 more on the beaches because of what they did to his his ambassadors and so forth, and the other 30,000 are then um, sold off as slaves. And by the time he's done, he has scraped clean all of the material that had been old tire. Okay. Now, there's one more thing, though. And this caused me personally a really big problem because it says it's never going to be rebuilt. And if you look at the, and I went on the internet, if you look at the, at the, video, uh, the um, pictures, satellite pictures of that area, you'll see that you've got the causeway still there out to the, well, it's not an island anymore, and the causeway is now about probably half a mile wide because in 2,000 years, you know, sand and whatever filled it all in, okay? And it's old tire we're talking about that's never going to be rebuilt. The new tire, there's, there's houses and stuff out there. And, um, and there's a fishing village. But where across where tire would be, there are houses. It's built up. And I'm thinking, I, I, I know what the scripture says, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, Lord, how do I bring this? Because it doesn't look like it's accurate. Well, some other people had the same problem, and as I'm doing more and more research, I came across a fellow who came across a document from a fellow by the name of Strabo, S-T-R-A-B-O. He was a geographer, a Greek geographer at the time of Christ. And what he did, he described how he came down to Sidon, and then he crossed several rivers, and he came to New Tyre, and he went 30 stadii, and he came to Old Tyre. 30 stadii. That's about three miles. In my mind, I had equated the fact that he had gone from the old city, built that causeway directly to the island. Well, it makes sense that you're going to pick the shortest distance from point A to point B when you've got to put in 18 feet depth 200 feet wide, a half mile long, you're going to go the shortest distance. But Old Tyre was not opposite. It's three miles south. And when you look at the picture, the satellite pictures, guess what? There's nothing there. And in fact, doing a little more research, it is actually 
a World Heritage Nature Site. And nothing is ever going to be built on it because the UN <laughs> has said, you know, this, this, we're not building on this. And so 2,000 plus, 2,300 years later, God's word is still accurate. Now, why did I bring all this to you? I spent you know, half my time here talking about Tyre. And I want to close it off with this. Why did I take the time? My purpose here is to show the character of God, the truth of his word, the fact that we can depend upon it to the minutest detail. If God says it's going to be planted, they're going to plant it. If he says it's going to be scraped like a rock, it's going to be scraped like a rock. And here's my point. If God can be that accurate and that precise in past prophecies, don't we have cause to believe that as we move on to future prophecies, they will be just as accurate? And that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow, uh, next week because I'm going to look at Christ. Do you know there are 300 prophecies on Christ's initial coming to earth? We're going to look at those. And then from then on, we'll look at some other things. But next week, I've kind of titled it The 2,000-Year-Old Comma. 2,000-Year-Old Comma. And we'll have to see what that's about next week. Trust you've enjoyed it. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. Let's close with a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that you have chosen to prophesy and also to fulfill. We ask, Lord, that you uh, be with us as we look at the, at, the, at the material. And, Lord, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts. And, Lord, we ask now that you bless us. And, Lord, give safety as we travel home. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you are dismissed. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I told him he could close it out, but I'm going to close it out. So <laughs> I forgot about that. And one thing, I wasn't sure if I heard you, that you announced when you were reading in um, Ezekiel, it says that um, it was going to be a place where they were going to spread their nets. Did yes. you mention that? Yep. Yeah. I didn't was, mention that, but yes, they do. Yeah, I thought that was really cool when you first told that because um, that causeway that they put out there took all the stones and stuff from Ty Tyre and put it out there, and now that's a place where fishermen go and lay out their nets and everything, even to this day, if I'm correct. So, you know, it's just awesome how precise the Word of God is when he tells us about prophecies. Amen? Amen. Thank you for coming. Looking forward to next week. Come on back. Have a good night. <laughs>